I, hello, I, we're gonna start in just a few minutes, but uh, if, if in the meantime you can turn down or turn off your cell phones, that'd be great. Okay, thank you, cell phones. Thank you very much. There are some chairs over here if you'd like to take a chair and set them up. No, you're okay? Okay, good. Uh, in this evening's reading, Liz Benedict will introduce Jim Shepard and I'll introduce Frank Bedard. Liz Benedict. Try to do this with a straight face, but I'm not sure it's going to work. <laughs> Perhaps a good introduction. What was I thinking, agreeing to introduce Jim Shepard this week at the Writers Institute? What can you say about a writer like Jim Shepard? One thing is that there isn't another writer like him. Another writer whose fiction is so epically out there, ricocheting from grim kitchens in Bridgeport, Connecticut, to ancient Greece, from Mars to the depths of the ocean, and down into the primordial ooze of a place you might have heard of called the Black Lagoon, from the nuclear reactor post-meltdown in Chernobyl, to, to, to Tokyo in World War II, to an ordinary dog pound in the U.S. where a guy in a wheelchair has come to abandon his 11-year-old dog who does a trick called reach for the sky. Aeschylus is a <laughs> Aeschylus is a character in one of Jim's stories, and so is Bush's Attorney General John Ashcroft, and a pair of gay lovers who work on the Hindenburg, and a real-life dude who did special effects for Godzilla, and a punk kid who's planning a Columbine-style massacre at his high school and who hates everyone and everyone hates him back, and a haunting and haunted man who operates the guillotine in Paris during the French Revolution and whose job it is to decapitate the king and the queen. I mean, I can't think of another writer who zigzags and rockets every which way across history, science, politics, movies, mother nature, gun shows, and the anguish of family life the way Jim Shepard does, imagining and reimagining horrific historic disasters, the daily dramas in the United States of We Love Our Automatic Weapons, and dining room eruptions that shatter households and the nervous systems of everyone in them. If you read any of Jim Shepard's book, you see books, you see he has these lists at the front or back of them of the books he read just to write that book. And he reads like 30,000 obscure books for every one that he writes. So you get the distinct impression that he's not just making shit up. <laughs> And that when he writes about the creature from the Black Lagoon, he knows everything there is to know about creatures and Black Lagoons. History and Jim's own imag dazzling imagination come at you from every direction, and so does something else woven pretty tightly into the fabric of his work. Let's call it this epic aggression. Let's call it an attitude. What writer calls a book like you'd understand anyway, and calls his next book, you think that's bad, <laughs> and delivers stories called Glut Your Soul on My Accursed Ugliness and Trample the Dead Hurdle the Weak. Sure, there are some gentle souls in Shepherdsville, some wounded birds, some boys you might want to adopt, some grown men so racked with grief and guilt that they might be the only two emotions left on the planet. So no, not everyone is off his rocker with rage here, but there's enough to fill a few ocean-going oil tankers lots of angry teenage boys, pissed off mothers and wives, brothers against brothers, high school football players, gun nuts, school principals. Sometimes they co confide in us about how angry they are 
and sometimes they just mouth off. Tip over dining room tables, blast an auditorium full of high school kids at assembly. Here's the narrator in The Gun Lobby, a short story, who's being held hostage at gunpoint by his very pissed off wife, whose anger he actually understands. Quote, I've been a problem baby, he tells us, a lousy son, a distant brother, an off-putting neighbor, a piss-poor student, a worrisome seatmate, an unreliable employee, a bewildering lover, a frustrating confidant, and a crappy husband. This guy is pretty insightful compared to the father who says to his kid, what goes through your fucking head? Your brain stuck up your ass? Or a husband to a wife, you couldn't find your ass with both hands and a banjo. <laughs> or the father who calls the family dog shit face. Sometimes the character's hostility leaps off the page and slams you in the chest. Sometimes it's funny because it's unexpected and colorful and paradoxical, and you think, geez, mothers don't usually say things like that to their kids. And other times it's desperate because these characters are all out of moves, like the unhappy boy at summer camp who says to another boy, shouldn't you be jerking off? But even with the angriest characters, every once in a while, Jim makes his creations drill down into their crap attitudes and get in touch with what's underneath because there's always some huge hurt down there. Betrayal, loneliness, terror, the certainty that no one likes you, maybe not even your mother. And the only way to deal with a truth so painful is to gather it up into a ball of rage and hurl it at the universe like you'd understand anyway. And sure, there's plenty of attitude here, but there's also art, beauty, poetry, wonder, and wicked mean storytelling. Jim Shepard is seriously into all of them, and his characters are too, even when they don't know they are. I heard a rumor about Jim. Could it be true? When he teaches writing, he starts every class by reading a poem aloud. Art and beauty and poetry rescue some of his most despairing characters, though sometimes it's only for a few minutes. So even though they're swimming in blood, guilt, loserdom, war, and melancholy, there's this message that seeps out that, like, maybe there's something beautiful you can look for or create or hang on to if you're lucky enough to dwell in its presence even for a few minutes. Shepherdsville is an encyclopedia beyond the ordinary alphabet. Jim's volumes burst with heartbreak, history, monster movies, mental illness, piano lessons, baseball, deep sea diving, and many sets of brothers. So many brothers in these pages. Angry brothers, dying brothers, brothers with nothing to say to one another, the eternal brotherhood of disappointment and severed connections. And then you turn the page and you're like on Mars or in Australia, or Tokyo, or hanging out with the creature from the Black Lagoon. What was I thinking? Jim Shepard is in the house. Deal with it. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. I thought that was nice. Did you think that was nice? Bill Kennedy's unhappy, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> You've been here like 30 seconds, like speaking in a microphone. <laughs> That's better, right? You like that, right? <laughs> Are there any other elderly who can't hear? <laughs> um, as many of us who've read this week have made clear, one of the particular pleasures of gatherings like this involves hearing that you're admired by people you admire. So thank you for that, Liz. That was very nice. And you didn't come across any letters from W.S. Merwin about me, did you? <laughs> Boy, you can't top that. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, and by the way, Aeschylus wrote? <laughs> Let me reassure you, this, by the way, is not a permanent facial deformity. I'm talking about the marks on my forehead and not the rest of the sad mess. I took my daughter and her friend on that Green Beret training obstacle and ropes course thing called Adirondack Extreme, <laughs> which I recommend to anyone who wants to severely aggravate old injuries. 
and randomly generate new ones. One of the great things about my daughter, by the way, and there she is right there. Raise your hand, Lucy. One of the great things about my daughter <clears throat> is that, like my wife, she talks in her sleep, usually indignantly. <laughs> and last night, at about four in the morning, it's totally silent. And I hear Lucy go, I am not a sassy rapper. <laughs> so now we have a new nickname for her. I'm going to read from a new novel that's coming out from Knopf this next May. The novel's called The Book of Aaron. I've always, as Liz has so <laughs> beautifully put it, been interested in children and catastrophe and ethical passivity. And this new thing seems to want to bring those three together under maximum pressure. As you'll hear, it's set in Poland before and mostly during World War II, and mostly in the Warsaw Ghetto. I'm going to read from the beginning, so there won't be any of that. You need to know there's this white whale, see? And, <laughs> and this <clears throat> will only be the second time I've read any part of this to anybody, so if you don't like it, I am screwed, essentially. <laughs> Somebody just made a great snorting noise. That was great. Boogers all over. Okay. My mother and father named me Aaron, but my father said they should have named me What Have You Done? And my uncle told everyone they should have called me What Were You Thinking? I broke medicine bottles by crashing them together and let the neighbor's animals loose from pens. My mother said my father shouldn't beat such a small boy, but my father said that one misfortune was never enough for me. And my uncle told her that my kind of craziness was like stealing from the rest of the family. When I complained about it, my mother reminded me I had only myself to blame, and that in our family, the cure for a toothache was to slap the other side of your face. My older brother was always saying we all went without cradles for our backsides or pillows for our heads. Why didn't he complain some more, my mother suggested. Maybe she could light the stove with his complaints. My uncle was my mother's brother, and he was the one who started calling me Shmaya because I did so many things that made him put his finger to his nose as a warning and say, God has heard. We shared a house with another family in Panavesh near the Lithuanian border. We lived in the front room with a four-paned window and a big stove with a tin sheet on top. Our father was always off looking for money. For a while, he sold animal hides. Our mother wished he would do something else, but he always said the Pope and the peasant each had their own work. She washed other people's floors, and when she left for the day, our neighbors did whatever they wanted to us. They stole our food and threw our things into the street. Then she came home exhausted and had to fight with them about how they'd treated us, while I hid behind the rubbish pile in the courtyard. When my older brothers got home, they'd be part of the shouting, too. Where's Shmaya, they'd ask, when it was over. I'd still be behind the rubbish pile. When the wind was strong, grit got in my eyes. Shmaya only looks out for himself, my uncle always said. But I never wanted to be like that. I lectured myself on walks. I made lists of ways I could improve. Years went by like one unhappy day. My mother tried to teach me the alphabet unsuccessfully. She used a big paper chart attached to a board and pointed to a bird or a little man or a purse and then to the letter that went with them. A whole day was spent trying to get me to draw the semicircle and straight line of the letter Aleph. But I was like something that had been raised in the wild. I didn't know the names of objects. Teachers talked to me, and I stared back. My last cater results before we moved reported that my conduct was unsatisfactory, my religion unsatisfactory, my arithmetic unsatisfactory, and even my wood and metal shop work unsatisfactory. My father called it the most miserable report he had ever seen and invited us all to figure out how I had pulled it off. 
My mother said that I might have been getting better in some areas, and he told me that if God gave me a second or third life, I'd still understand nothing. He said a person with strong character could correct his path and start again, but a coward or weakling could not. I always wondered if others had such difficulty in learning. I always worried what would become of me if I couldn't do anything at all. It was terrible to have to be the person I was. I spent rainy days building dams in the street to divert the runoff. I found boards and pushed them along puddles with sticks. My mother dragged me out of the storms, saying when she found me that there I sat with my dreams full of fish and pancakes. She said while she bundled me into bed next to the stove that I'd never avoided an illness from chicken pox to measles to scarlet fever to whooping cough, and that was why I'd spent my whole life 99% dead. <laughs> At night, I lay waiting for sleep like our neighbor's dog waited for passing wagons. When she heard me, still awake, my mother would come to my bedside even as tired as she was. To help me sleep, she said, that if I squeezed my eyelids tight, lights and planets would float down past them, though I'd never be able to count them before they disappeared. She said that her grandfather told her that God moved those lights and planets with his little finger. I told her I was sorry for the way I was, and she said that she wasn't worried about school, only about how I was with my family and our neighbors. She said that too often my tongue worked but not my head, or my head worked, but not my heart. Yet, when my younger brother was born, I told her I wanted him thrown into the chicken coop. I was glum that whole year, when I was four, because of an infected vaccination on my arm. My mother said I played alone even when other kids were about. Two years went by without my learning a thing. I didn't know how to swim or ride a bicycle. I had no grandparents, no aunts, and no godparents. When I asked why, my father said it was because society's parasites ate well while the worthy received only dirty water. And my mother said it was because of sickness. <laughs> I attended Cater until my father came back from one of his trips and told my mother that it was 1936 and time for me to get a modern education. I was happy to change since our teacher always had food in his beard and caned us across his, the fingers for wrong answers and his house smelled like a kennel. So instead, I went to public school, which was cleaner all around. My father was impressed that my new teacher dressed in the European style and that after he taught me to read, I started teaching myself. Since I was bored and knew no one, I took to books. And in public school, I met my first friend, whose name was Udall. I liked him. Like me, he had no future. <laughs> he was always running somewhere with his nose dripping. We made rafts to put in the river and practiced long-distance spitting. He called me Shmaya too, and I called him Pisher. When he wasn't well-behaved, he was clever enough to keep the teacher from catching on. One morning, before anyone arrived, we played Tip Cat so violently we broke some classroom windows. We scared the boys who had nice satchels and never went barefoot. He was always getting me into trouble at home. And one Sabbath, I was beaten for taking apart the family scissors so I could have two little swords for him and for me. His mother taught him only sad songs, including one about the king of Siberia, before she got sick because of her teeth and died. He came looking for me once she was dead, but I hid from him. He told me the next day that two old men carried her out of the house on a board, and then his father moved him away. That summer, a card arrived from my father, from his cousin in Warsaw, telling him that there was work in the factory. The factory made fabric out of cotton thread. My father hitched a ride to the city in a truck full of geese and then sent for us. He moved us to 21 Zamenhofer Street, apartment number six. My mother had us each memorize the address so we could find it when we got lost. And my younger brother, who had a bad lung, spent his days at the back window looking out at the garbage bins. We both thought the best thing about the move was the tailor shop across the square. The tailor made uniforms for the army, and in the front of his window, 
There were three rows of hand-sized mannequins, each dressed in miniature uniforms. We especially loved the tiny service ribbons and medals. Because it was summer, I was expected to work at the factory so far away that we had to ride the trolley. I was shut up in a little room with no windows and four older boys and set to finishing the fabrics. The bolts had to be scraped until they acquired a grain like you found on winter stockings. Each of them took hours, and someone as small as me had to lean his chest onto the blade to scrape with enough force. One, on hot days, sweat ran off me like rain off a roof. The other boys said things like, what a fine young man from the country we now have in our midst. He's clearly going to be a big wheel in town. And I thought, am I only here so they can make fun of me? And I refused to go back. My father said he would give me such a beating, it would hurt to raise my eyebrows. But while I sat there like a mouse under the broom, my mother stopped him and said, there was plenty I could do at home, and school was beginning in a few weeks anyway. My father said I'd only been given a partial hiding, and she told him that would do for now. And that night, once they started snoring, I crept to their beds and kissed her goodnight and pulled the blanket from his feet so maybe he'd catch a chill. <laughs> because I couldn't sleep, I helped her with the day's first chores, and she told everyone she was lucky to have a son who didn't mind rising so early. I worked hard and kept her company. I emptied her wash buckets and fetched compresses from my brother's chest. She asked if this wasn't much better than breaking bottles and getting into trouble, and I told her it was. I was still so small that I could squat and ride the bristle block of the long-handled brush she used to polish the floors. When she told my father, at least now their children were better behaved, he told her that not one of us looked either well-fed or good-tempered. He joked at dinner that she cooked like a washerwoman. Go to a restaurant, she said in response. She later told me that when she was young, she never complained. So her mother would always know who her best child was and keep her near. So I became myself only once the lights went out. And in the mornings, went back to pretending things were OK. At our new school, we sat not at one filthy table, but on real school benches. I wanted more books, but had no money for them. And when I tried to borrow them from my classmates, they said no. I dealt with bullies by not fighting until the bell for class was about to be rung. When my mother complained to my teacher that a classmate had called me a dirty Jew, my teacher said, well, he is, isn't he? And from then on, she made me take weekly baths. I stayed at that school until another teacher twisted a girl's ear until he tore it. And then my mother moved me back to the cheder where they also taught Polish, two trolley stops away. But I still shrank from following instruction like a dog from a stick. My new teacher asked my mother what anyone could do with a kid who was so full of answers. He's like a fox, this one, he said. He's eight going on 80. And when she reported the meeting to my father, he gave me another hiding. That night, she came to my bedside and sat and asked me to explain myself. And at first, I couldn't answer. And then I finally told her that I had figured out that most people didn't understand me and that those who did wouldn't help. My two older brothers got jobs outside of town, driving goats to the slaughterhouse and were gone until after dark. And like my father, they thought my mother should stay at home. So she confided in me about her plan to expand her laundry business. She said it was no gold mine, but it could be a serious help, especially before Passover and Rosh Hashanah. She told me she used some of their hidden savings to buy soap and bleach and barrels, and that every time my father passed the money's hiding place, she had a block of ice under her skull and could feel every hair on her head. I said, why shouldn't she take the money? And she was so happy that she told me that once I turned nine, she would make me a full partner. <laughs> and this made me happy, because I knew that once I had enough money, I would run away to Palestine or Africa. 
The week before Passover, we set giant pots of water to boil on the stove and pushed all the bed linens and garments we'd collected from our customers into two barrels with metal rims, and she lathered everything with a yellow block of soap before we rinsed it all and ran it through the wringer and dragged all that wet laundry and baskets up to the attic where she'd strung ropes in every direction under the rafters. Since we opened the windows for the cross breezes, she couldn't rest that night and whispered to me, about the gangs that specialized in crossing rooftops to steal laundry. So I slept up there so she could relax. See, you don't only care about yourself, she whispered when she came to wake me the next morning. She put her lips to my head and her hand to my cheek. And when she touched me like that, it was as if the person everyone hated had flown away. And while he was gone, I didn't let her know that I was already awake. I didn't need to play with anyone, so after school, I came home and helped her instead. While my younger brother napped, we talked about our days. I told her about a soldier on a horse near the trolley stop on Geisha who took some coins from his saddlebag and handed them to me. And she asked if I'd thanked him, and of course I hadn't. She agreed it was a strange thing he'd done and wondered if he'd been thinking of his own little boy. We listened to our neighbors arguing across the hall, and she said the father spent his days in the synagogue securing himself a place in the next world while the mother wore herself out, seeing that everyone was fed. She said the mother had had 14 children and that six had survived. I said maybe they were finished having children, and she said that for the mother's sake may a six-winged angel descend with the news. I did kindnesses, for my mother, but she always wanted me to do them instead for my little brother. He was afraid of everything. She kept a lit candle near his bed to drive shadows out of corners because his window had no shutters, and at night he always thought someone was standing beside it outside or knocking on the wall, and he cried himself to sleep about it. When she went to comfort him, his eyes were so full of fear it scared me to look at them. Our father shouted at him to stop, which made things worse. He reminded my brother that everyone in the building understood that, peop- that parents didn't need to hold back and could give rule breakers what they deserved. He'd work himself up about it, and then our mother would placate him in the other room after telling me to stay with my brother and do what I could to quiet him down. My brother had all sorts of medicines, and drops and inhaler pots on his bedside table, and my mother taught us how to grab his head and tilt it forward when he had trouble breathing and started to choke. He hated being inside all the time, and finally ran away and left a note saying he'd had enough of this life, and he was missing for two days. Once he was back, my mother locked him in the apartment, and he pulled his chair to the window so he could see outside. I didn't understand him but liked the blank way he didn't complain. He cupped any treat he was given in his hands and peeked at it before he passed it along to one of us. If he wasn't napping or staring out his window, he stayed near my mother. When he got angry, he didn't hit anyone or shout, but instead went for days without speaking. My mother had a saying about how quiet he got, that his wisdom died inside of him something her own mother had said about her. She told the neighbors that as a toddler, he'd once laid himself spread-eagled on the trolley tracks to prevent her from leaving, and she'd had to carry him home, and that when she asked him about it afterwards, he'd put his hands over her mouth. He loved the radio, and it was because of him that I first heard Janusz Korszak's show. Thursday afternoons, I had to sit with him, and we could hear it through the wall, since our neighbor's wife was hard of hearing. The show was called The Old Doctor, and I liked it because even though he complained about how alone he was, he also always wanted to know more about other people, especially kids. I also liked that I never knew what to expect. Sometimes he interviewed poor orphans in a summer camp. Sometimes he talked about what he loved about airplanes or told a fairy tale. He made his own barnyard noises. When I asked my mother why the show was called The Old Doctor, she said there'd been complaints about allowing a Jewish educator to shape the minds of Polish children. 
That was also the year I first ate in a restaurant. My father took me to celebrate some good fortune he never explained. It was the first time I was able to choose my own food. While I was eating dessert, he made me laugh by breaking walnuts with his teeth. That night I dreamed that a raven was sitting on my shoulder in the wind and a black cloak was streaming out behind me. And when my father was getting dressed the next morning, I put my arms around him. What's the matter with him today? He asked my mother before he left. The kids on my block reacted to my lack of interest with their own. Sometimes they threw stones at me. Another whole summer came and went. I wanted to learn how to ride a bicycle, so I went to a boy who owned one, and he said he would teach me. I could get on by myself after the first lesson, but then he wouldn't teach me anymore. I met Lutek one evening when I sat near some kids I didn't know, and they told me to leave, and I didn't. He had, rabbit, he had a rabbit skin cap with ear flaps, and when one of the kids asked where he got it, he said that he'd found it between the kid's mother's legs. So they started pushing him around. They knocked him into me, so I shoved the kid who'd done it, and he landed on his back and head on the paving stones. The other kids chased us, and Lutek led me into a cellarway hidden by a coal chute, and they all ran him by. I asked how he'd found it, and he said he'd been hiding since before I was born. While we sat there in the dark, I asked him more questions, but he stopped answering and just sniffed at the air like a dog. He was even smaller than me. He was so small, he said he had a younger sister who everyone thought was older. He said the village he was from was pitiful. It didn't appear on maps, and it was just three lanes of cottages, fences, and mud. It, he'd gone to school for a year at one of the Talmud Torahs on Miva Street, which he said was famous for graduating ignoramuses. He said his father was the strongest porter in the city and pulled a handcart he harnessed to himself like a horse. He was especially good with the huge machinery crates from Lodz that three men had trouble budging. Otherwise, he sat in a tavern. He worked at the railroad station near Yavazevsky's courtyard. That neighborhood scared me. Smoke from the slag heaps always darkened the air over the loading docks. My mother was happy I'd made a friend, but soon upset that I was never around to watch my younger brother once Lutek took charge of my education. He showed me how to steal from the vegetable carts, how one of us, by making a commotion, could hide what the other was doing, even when the peddlers were watching out for one another. With a French pamphlet he took from a bookstall, he proved I didn't know anything about girls and discovered I knew so little I didn't even know what he was talking about. After he had cursed some filthy Russians, he also said I didn't know anything about politics, which was also true. He taught me that no one else's problems should get in the way of our having a good time. I told him about all the trouble I'd gotten into with Udall, including the broken school windows, but he was unimpressed. His family had moved three times since coming to Warsaw. And in one neighborhood, he'd been hauled in by the police for breaking down the door of a boy who'd stolen his cap. And in another, for having put a hole in a boy's head with a jeweler's hammer. He said the kid was okay after a while. <laughs> Though he'd had to wear a head bandage and everyone had called him the sheik. <laughs> I asked if his father beat him for such offenses. And he said he'd had more luck with his father's strap since he'd learned to rub garlic and onion onto the welts and that he was lucky that his father was more upset about his sister's stutter. His father tried to cure it by mimicking her, to shame her into getting over it. She liked me because when I had to wait for her to finish what she was saying, I never got impatient. She told Lutek I was kind and that he should bring me around more often, so he had me talk to her while he slipped money from her secret hiding spot. He said she knew he stole from her, but she never complained about it. When he took enough, we would buy sausages and ride the trolley. On those days, I was around, and my younger brother was feeling better. My mother ordered me to take him to the park so he could get some fresh air. He was always thrilled to go. The back courtyard out his window with the garbage bins got no light and was deserted except for the occasional stray cat. Lutek always found us wherever we went. 
He said that being saddled with a consumptive wasn't the end of the world and that we could always find some uses for him. So one day we persuaded him to steal a jar of jam and another to sing to a policeman. Or else we went about our business and he followed along. Whenever Lutek saw my younger brother's blank look, he asked him, so how's the weather in Vilno? A joke my younger brother never understood. On our way home, I told him not to tell our mother about whatever it was we had done. And then she said he had to. And so he did. And I wouldn't get supper that night. Then, after he went to sleep, she would sit at the foot of my bed and we'd look at each other. Neither of us would speak until she finally asked me to try to remain a decent human being and then kissed my cheek before wishing me a good night. And I would look up at my ceiling in the darkness and remember that I gave her nothing in return for what she gave me and almost never had. And then I would plan my next day with Lutec. I'm going to stop there. You read the poetry of Frank Bedart, and you imagine him, I at least imagine him, asking himself the question, what is this? That was good. I'll hold it. It looks like it's broken, actually. That's weird. Yeah. That must be it. <laughs> I don't know what the hell we're going to do, Mom. You want to uh, hold it? Can you hold well, it? Well, I can hold it. It's Papa Frank. Now. Yeah, I, I have no trouble, but it's... Hmm. It kind of looks irreparable. It looks, yeah, it looks broken. It is. Yeah. Is there any more? Yes, yeah. I don't... Yeah, we just okay. Need to Sorry, hang on for a moment. Yeah, I, I can do this. But you can yeah. probably go on with this. Oh, I can, for yeah. sure, yeah. Well, okay, I'll, be, I'll, I'll continue. I can do this. And then we'll see where we are, Frank. I may have to stand here holding it for you. No, no, it won't go. You read the poetry of Frank Bedart, and you imagine him asking himself the question, what is this thing, this voice inside me, that isn't me. Frank, as we well know, has given us, invented, appropriated, taken over a great many voices, inhabited, should we say, has been inhabited by characters drawn from myth, from movies, from newspapers, and many other sources. And though it is fair to say that these figures are not Frank, can't be frank. It is also fair to say that they are a part of him and everything he says and feels and thinks. Frank has been in search of himself for at least as long as he's been writing poems. But the search has entailed the steady summoning of the presences, real and unreal presences, who have passed through him and breathe with him to lesser and greater degrees with every breath he takes. This is not an easy or common arrangement, for Frank allows himself to possess and to be possessed in a degree that is unmatched anywhere else in our poetry. There is chaos, there is frenzy in Frank's relation to the many others that clamor for attention within him. As you read him, you feel his determination to let the surging voices or presences have their way with him, even as you feel the strict mastery of those voices, the rage to harness them and order them. 
Another poet writes in a recent book that overthinking is the ruin of imagination. And of course, we know what he's getting at. But Frank is never in danger of overthinking, because in him, thinking is never divorced from obsession and desire. Like other infatuates, I've been trying for a long time to bring Frank efficiently into focus, searching for ways to do justice to poems that range from brief, shapely, stabbing lyrics to lengthy narratives, hoping to encompass his moods and accents, his decisive moves from rage to tenderness, his sudden vulnerability, his alertness to menace within and without. Often in reading Frank, I want him to hold back a little, to take deeper breaths, to defend himself just a little more than he does. But then there is no mistaking his unwillingness to pull back, the intense, dangerous pleasure he takes in traveling all the way down to dark places where whatever the delight he takes in sweetness and light, he longs also to be. Longs to get down with the bodies desired and killed in the narrow crawl spaces and unbreathing abrupt descents. This, of course, Frank's language. Wants whatever lies still uncarried from the abyss within me. Impossible, as I say each year uh, in this room, to show what Frank does without simply bringing him out to do it himself. But as always, I can't get out of the way without quoting here and there a small passage and saying, see, and doesn't that about show it? And so here, one sentence, quote, to be a child is to see things and not know them. Then you know them, unquote. I read that one day to a Russian friend who said, great, really great, so terrible, it makes me happy. <laughs> she also said, great, to these words from Frank's poem, Dream of the Book. Inheritor, inheriting inheritors, you must earn what you inherit. And with that, I give you a man who has earned what he has inherited and demanded of us that we, in turn, be coiled and ready to struggle with the great inheritance he has set at our feet. Frank Bedard. Can you do it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what a marvelous um, introduction. Um, it's not me, of course, but uh, uh, you, def you define a writer I would like to be. And uh, how hard it is to, to follow um, Jim Shepard. My God, he's so good and uh, ferocious and uh, dark. Anyway, you've set the problem. I'm going to read um, a couple of poems that 
rely on um, pre-existing narratives. And uh, they don't tell the story of the narrative, um, the story that they allude to altogether. So you have to, uh, to some degree, um, figure out the narrative that is being discussed. The first is about a movie called Pandora and the Flying Dutchman. Uh, it's not a very good movie. Um, one does not only get caught by good movies, but sometimes by things that are not terribly good, but something about the constellation of characters or scenes or forces uh, one's imagination inhabits. And that happened for me with Pandora and the Flying Dutchman. Um, This is called, He is Ava Gardner. <laughs> he is Ava Gardner at the height of her beauty in Pandora and the Flying Dutchman. I had allowed him to become, for me, necessity. I was not ever, for him, necessity. An adornment, yes, a grace note, not necessity. Everyone, the men at least, are crazy about Pandora. She's smart, self-deprecating, funny. She who has seen seemingly everything about love and says she has no idea what love is. Who knows the world finds her beautiful so that she must test every man and slightly disgusted, find him wanting. Clearly, she is not in this crowd of men eager to please her, to flatter and bring her drinks, found someone who is for her necessity. Watching Pandora and the Flying Dutchman, you feel sympathy for the beautiful who cannot find anyone who is for them necessity. He is Ava Gardner at the height of her beauty. Fucked up. You knew you'd never fall for someone not fucked up. <laughs> you watch her test each suitor. She sings about love to an old friend, drunk, a poet. He asks her to marry him. After she again refuses, you see him slip something into his drink. Then he dies, poisoned. She says he has tried that too many times. Now she feels nothing. Promising nothing, she asks the famous race car driver, who also wants to marry her, to shove the car he has worked on for months over the cliff into the sea. He does. In the first flush of pleasure, she agrees to marry him. The next day, he has the car's carcass pouring water dragged up from the sea. You are the learned, amused professor, surrounded by his collections, who carefully pieces together fragments of Greek pots. You know it is foolish to become another suitor or de comba. Soon, you are the only one she trusts. You become at moments her confessor. Then she meets the Dutchman. He offers little, asks nothing. When she withdraws her attention, he isn't spooked. Because when she meets him, he is painting the portrait of someone who has her face. With petulance, she scrapes off the face. He charmingly makes her head a blank ovoid and says, that's better. She thinks that she is the knife that cutting him will heal him. You know, she is right. 
you have discovered he is the fabled Dutchman who for centuries has sailed the world seas, unable to die, unable to die though he wants to die. You know what it is to want to die. His reasons are a little contrived, a mechanism of the plot, reasons that Pandora at the end discovers he murdered centuries before through jealousy and paranoia, his wife. Now, unless he can find a woman willing to die out of love for him, sail out with him and drown, he cannot ever find rest. This logic makes sense to her. She who does not believe in love will perform an act proving its existence. She wants, of course, to throw her life away. The Dutchman will always arrive because that's what she wants. Those of us who look on, who want the proximate and partial to continue, loathe the hunger for the absolute. All your life you have watched as two creatures think they have found in each other necessity. Watched as the shell then closes for a time around them. You envy them as you gather with the rest of the village staring out to sea. When she swims out to his boat to give herself, both succeed at last in drowning. Couples stay together when each of the two remains a necessity for the other, which you cannot know until they cease to be. Tautology that is the sum of what you know. He's a master. He's lived by becoming the master of the alchemy that makes, as you stare into some one person's eyes, makes you adore him. Eyes that say that despite the enormous landscapes that divide you, you are brothers. He too is trapped in all that divides soul from soul. Then, suddenly he is fluttering his finger ends between yours. He rises from the table, explains he had no sleep last night, and leaves. You couldn't worm your way into becoming for him necessity. When did he grow bored with seduction and confessors and find the Dutchman? For months there has been nothing but silence. When you sent him a pot, only you could have with care pieced together from the catastrophe of history more silence. The enterprise is abandoned. Something there is in me that makes me think I need this thing, that gives this thing the illusion of necessity, as enthralled to flesh as I. He could not see beneath this old face I now wear, this ruinous, ugly body, that I, I am the Dutchman. But nobody knows when living where necessity lies. Maybe later, if history is lucky, the urn will not refuse to be pieced together. This is neither good nor bad. It is what is. Short poem now, Name the Bed. Half light just after dawn, as you turn back in the doorway, you to whom the ordinary sensuous world seldom speaks, expected to see in the thrown off rumpled bedclothes nothing. 
scream stretched across it. Someone wanted more from that bed than was found there. <laughs> Name the bed that's not true of. <laughs> bed where your twin died. Eraser bed. Now I'm going to read a longish poem about writing a, much, a poem I wrote in 1975 called Ellen West. And um, Ellen West is based on a great essay by a man named Ludwig Binswanger. And it's part of the uh, first collection of papers in English in phenomenological psychotherapy. And the Binswanger essay is a great essay. And one of the difficulties of writing the poem was trying in any way to live up to uh, the original. This is called Writing Ellen West. Writing Ellen West was exorcism. Exorcism of that thing within Frank that wanted after his mother's death to die. Inside him was that thing that he must expel from him to live. He read the case of Ellen West as a senior in college and immediately wanted to write a poem about it, but couldn't. So he stored it, as he has stored so much that awaits existence. Unlike Ellen, he was never anorexic, but like Ellen, he was obsessed with eating and the arbitrariness of gender and having to have a body. Ellen lived out the war between the mind and the body, lived out in her body each stage of the war, its journey and progress, in which compromise, reconciliation is attempted then rejected, then mourned, till she reaches at last in an ecstasy costing not less than everything, death. He was grateful he was not impelled to live out the war in his body, hiding in compromise, well wadded with art he adored and with stupidity and distraction. The particularity inherent in almost all narrative, though contingent and exhausting, tells the story of the encounter with particularity that flesh as flesh must make. Ellen West was written in the year after his mother's death. By the time she died, he had so thoroughly betrayed the ground of intimacy on which his life was founded he had no right to live. No use for him to tell himself that he shouldn't feel this because he felt this. He didn't think this, but he thought this. After she died, his body wanted to die, but his brain, his cunning, didn't. He likes narratives with plots that feel as if no one willed them. His mother in her last year revealed that she wanted him to move back to Bakersfield and teach at Bakersfield College and live down the block. <laughs> he thought his mother, without knowing that this is what she wanted, wanted him to die. All he had told her in words and more than words for years was that her possessiveness and terror at his independence were wrong, wrong, wrong. He was the only person she wanted to be with, but he refused to live down the block. And then she died. It must be lifted from the mind, must be lifted and placed elsewhere, must not remain in the mind alone. Out of the thousand myriad voices, thousand myriad stories in each human head, when his mother died, there was Ellen West. 
This is the body that you can draw out of you to expel from you the desire to die. Give it a voice. Give each scene of her life a particularity and necessity that in Binswanger's recital are absent. Enter her skin so that you can then make her other and expel her. Survive her. Animal mind, eating the ground of Western thought, the mind-body problem. She, who in the last months of her life abandoned writing poems in disgust at the failure of her poems, is a poem. She in death is incarnated on a journey whose voice is the voice of her journey. Arrogance of Plutarch, of Shakespeare and Berlioz, who thought they made what Cleopatra herself could not make. Arrogance of the maker. Verda killed himself and then young men all over Europe imitated him and killed themselves, but his author, Goethe, cunning master of praxis, lived. Frank thought when anything is made, it is made not by its likeness, not by its twin or mirror, but its opposite. Ellen, in his poem, asks, without a body, who can know himself at all? In your pajamas, you move down the stairs just to the point where the adults couldn't yet see you. To hear more clearly the din, the sweet cacophony of adults partying. Phonograph voices among them, phonograph voices, their magpie beauty. Sweet din, magpie beauty. One more poem, one more book in which you figure out how to make something out of not knowing enough. I'm going to read three more poems. Mouth. It was as if starving, his stomach rebelled at food. As quickly as he ate, it passed right through him. His body refused what his body needed. Recipe for death. But he said what others think is food isn't food. It passed right through him. He shoved meat into his mouth, but still his body retained nothing, absorbed nothing. He grows thinner. He thinks he cannot live on nothing. He has the persistent sense that whatever object he seeks is not what he seeks. Now he repeats the litany of his choices. Love, which always to his surprise exhilarated even as it tormented and absorbed him, unendingly under everything, art trying to make a work of art he can continue to inhabit. The choices he made, he said he made almost without choosing. The best times, I must confess, are when one, can, one cannot help oneself. Has his pride at his intricate inventions come to nothing? Nothing he can now name or touch is food. Sex was the bed where you learned to be naked and not naked at the same time. Bed where you learned to move the unsustainable weight inside, then too often lost the key to it. Faces too close that despite themselves promise, then out of panic, disappoint. Not just out of panic, only in his mind is he freely both here and not here. The imperious or imagined needs of those you love or think you love demand you forget that when you smell your flesh, 
You smell unfulfillment. We are creatures, he thinks, caught in an obscure, ruthless economy. His hunger grows as whatever his mouth fastens upon fails to feed him. Recipe for death. But he's sure he'll learn something once he sees La Notte again. He's placed Duino elegies next to his bed. He craves the cold catechism Joyce mastered, writing Ithaca. Now he twists within the box. He cannot exit or rise above. He thinks he must die when what will not allow him to retain food makes him see his body has disappeared. Two more poems. Elegy for Earth. Because Earth's inmates travel in flesh and hide from flesh and adore flesh, you hunger for flesh that does not die. But hunger for the absolute breeds hatred of the absolute. Those who are the vessels of revelation, or who think that they are, ravage us with the promise of rescue. My mother outside in the air, waving, shriveled, as if she knew this is the last time. Watching as I climbed the stairs and the plane swallowed me. She and I could no more change what we hurtled toward than we could change the weather. Finding my seat, unseen, I stared back as she receded. They drop into holes in the earth. Everything you loved, loved and hated as you will drop and the moment when all was possible, gone. You are still above earth, the moment when all and nothing is possible, long gone. Terrified of the sea, we cling to the hull. In adolescence, you thought your work ancient work, to decipher at last human beings' relation to God. Decipher love, to make what was once whole, whole again, or to see why it never should have been thought whole. Earth was a tiny labyrinthine ball orbiting another bigger ball, so bright you can go blind staring at it. When the source of warmth and light withdraws, then terrible winter. When burning and relentless, it draws too close. Their narcotically gorgeous, fecund earth withers as if the sun, as if the sun taught us what we will ever know of the source. Now, too far, then too close. Blood Island, where you for a time lived. And one more poem. for an unwritten opera. Once you had a secret love, seeing even his photo, a window was flung open high in the airless edifice that is you. Though everything looks as if it is continuing just as before, it is not. It is continuing in a new way. Sweet lingo, O'Hara and Ashbury teach. That's not how you naturally speak. 
you tell yourself first that he is not the heir you need. Second, that you loathe air. As a boy, you despise the world for replacing God with another addiction, love. Despised yourself, was there no third thing? That every blue moon, the skeptical, the adamantly disabused, find themselves like you, return to life by a secret, like him in you. Now you understand Yanacek at 70, in love with a much younger married woman, chastely writing her. As in Mozart, song remains, no matter how ordinary, how flawed the personae. For us poor mortals, private accommodations, magpie beauty. Thanks. Please come join Jim and Frank at the spa and Case College Center. Okay? See you then. <laughs>